Good evening. Thank you all for turning out. Does everybody have a place to sit, sort of? We have, we have a few more people than we were expecting. Um, my name is Laura Briggs. I'm chair of Women, Gender, Sexuality Studies. And I want to thank you all for coming out to this event. And it's my honor to be your moderator tonight. I want to start by saying that about the sort of ground of this conversation. And that is that when we talk, that anti-Semitism is harmful and real, not just in the pogroms of a century ago or the Holocaust of a half century ago, but is being expressed with renewed vehemence in the context of an opening in national politics for white nationalism. We felt this locally in the swastikas on Mount Tom on the day after Trump's election. And this actually hit home in a particularly personal way for me. Um, a seven-year-old friend of my son's who is Jewish was the person who found them. And somehow I thought that we would not have another generation facing exactly that. Um, Anti-Semitism also haunts a great deal of the inf political infrastructure of our current conjuncture. From the attempts to put in place a Muslim travel ban, which has its roots in the de facto ban on Jewish immigrants to the United States in the late 1930s and early 1940s, with deadly consequences. So anti-Semitism both grounds the current white ethnic nationalism historically and as a constituent part of it in the present which is what makes tonight's conversation both interesting and important, the question of whether anti-Semitism is a reasonable frame for understanding criticism of Israel's state policies, particularly with respect to Palestinians, or whether, as some have argued, anti-Semitism is being redefined such that critics of Israel are being accused and targeted more than the growing far right. So I hope this conversation is part of an invitation to all of us about how to think and combat anti-Semitism in the current moment. And our first speaker is Sat Jolly, um, to whom we owe this space. He's professor of communication at UMass and the founder and executive director of the Media Education Foundation. He's the author and editor of numerous books on media, culture, and commercialism, as well as producer or director of over 50 films. Most recently, he's the executive producer of the film The Occupation of the American Mind, Israel's PR War in the United States. This is a pretty actually, extraordinary moment in terms of the discussion around this, um, in terms of the number of events and books that are coming out addressing this very issue. Uh, you may have seen yesterday um, there was an event at the New School um, in New York, uh, which was almost exactly the same structure um, that, that we had as well. And that's online, I would really encourage you to... It was, it was hosted by, it was moderated by Amy Goodman. Uh, and it's online at the, Jacob, at the Jacobin um, magazine site. I really urge you to go and, and see that. Um, there's also the book by, by Jewish Voice for Peace that just also just <laughs> came out and that's available over there being held up. So it is actually a pretty, um, a pretty, amazing, pretty amazing moment. Um, the other thing that's really interesting right now today, and I've never had this, I've worked at the university now for 32 years, um, and I've never had this happen before, where someone um, is so threatened by an event that they organize an alternative event at the same time. This is an event that is being organized right now, is taking place at this very moment. And it was set up a week ago. It wasn't, this wasn't one of these things where it was like, you know, months in advance and no one knows. It was set up a week ago to compete with this event. It's a very strange notion of debate and discussion and conversation. Uh, it meant that they, perhaps deliberately, they, some people didn't want to come here. And that by itself should tell us the nature of this conversation and how difficult the conversation is. Now, I've been interested in the issue of, my, my interest in the area, or in this, in this topic, is in the issue of how the Israeli-Palestinian conflict has been represented in the American media. And we've done a couple of films around that. The most recent one uh, is this one, 
came out a couple of years ago called The Occupation of the American Mind, uh, Israel's Public Relations War in the US, um, narrated by, uh, by Roger Waters. Um, and one of the, and so what I've been interested not so much in the conflict, there are many people who have much more expertise in, in what is going on. I've been interested in the representation of it. That is, how is the story told? What is the narrative that is told about it? And one of the ways that discussion of this issue is shut down is by accusing people who are critical of Israeli policy and increasingly right-wing Israeli policy of being anti-Semitic, of being racist. And it's actually a very, very effective silencing mechanism. Because who wants to be called a racist? Who wants to be called, who wants to be called an anti-Semite? And it has worked, I think, for many years. It worked with me uh, for over a decade when I first started teaching in terms of, whether, in terms of dealing with this issue. Uh, so this is a clip from, I'm going to show you a couple of clips. Oh, by the way, I, when Laura said 13, I, actually, I meant 30. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to be showing some clips in between. Uh, so it's a little bit longer than the normal. <laughs> uh, so this is a clip from our most recent film, The Occupation of American Mind, talking about this. Um, and especially, I hope you pay attention to what Noam Chomsky says in it. There's always me. <laughs> and of course, there's no greater weapon in the attack arsenal than equating critical coverage of Israel's policies with anti-Semitism. Any fair-minded person who follows Al Jazeera knows it's anti-American and anti-Semitic. You're, a, Jew you're a Jewish man, correct? Yes, I am. It doesn't, it doesn't come more anti-Semitic than Al Jazeera. Uh, I, they, would, they, would, they would do violence uh, to you. Who and who? A journalist the, at Al Jazeera? The people would do, that run that they, network they would, would do, do violence, violence to you. I hardly think so. Abba Eben wrote an article in which he explained to American Jews what their task was. Their task is to show that anyone who's a critic of Zionism by which he means a critic of the policies of the state of Israel, must be either an anti-Semite or a neurotic, self-hating Jew. That covers 100% of possible criticism. We'll start tonight in, in the Middle East, where Israel... What? Israel isn't supposed to defend itself? Oh, yeah, if Mexico bombed Texas, will we exercise What other countries held to the same standard as Israel? Israel. People that want to destroy right. our terrorists? What is the matter with the only democracy in the Middle East, you Self-hating Jew? <laughs> so it used to be I was always called a self-hating Jew, and, and everybody like me was called a self-hating Jew. I am now not only a self-hating Jew, but they also call me an anti-Semite. How I, with my four Jewish grandparents, I'm still an anti-Semite. My wife was born in a displaced persons camp in Germany, and I'm an anti-Semite. They have, for a very long time, been able to effectively defend the indefensible. Uh, to the American public through miseducation and misinformation campaigns, uh, through effective talking points, uh, through uh, smearing individuals on the opposite uh, side of things, labeling them all kinds of things, sympathizers with terrorism. A couple of minutes from... <laughs> yeah. um, Youssef Munir was, on a, uh, was being interviewed by Sean Hannity, and that was the frame when he was being interviewed on, on, on Fox. So you must have really seen the interview. It's one, of the, I mean, it's one of the most disgusting pieces of television I think I've ever seen. And that goes, I mean, it beats anything else on Fox, which, is, which says something. So this is the general issue. Um, it, this, is, this is a cynical manipulation. And cynically manipulates the memory the Jews and others have of oppression and violence and the death camps and the gas chambers. It, it cynically manipulates the fear that comes from the memory of that history and channels it in a direction that distracts from what the state of Israel, not Jews, what the state of Israel is doing to the Palestinians. I'll say that again because actually Palestinians often disappear from this. What the state of Israel is doing to the Palestinians, that's actually what disappears. It's meant to deflect attention away from Palestinian suffering and from Palestinian victimization, to essentially make the Palestinians disappear and to present the situation only through the eyes of Israeli victimization. In that, to present Israel as the David against a giant Goliath. In that, it has been supremely successful. 
As it's done that, it's also deflected attention away from the real, from the centuries-old ideology and system of, of Christian anti-Semitism. We have to remember Christian anti-Semitism is a European invention, is a European, is a European creation that is then exported around the world. Um, but it has deflected attention away from that. And especially now, at a time when it is rising in both the US, uh, Charlottesville would be a good example of that, and in Europe in general. And that, that old-fashioned, that, old fashioned, that the, the anti-Semitism of the, the alt-right, of the fascist right, uh, and the some anti-Semitism of the new fascists in Europe has actually nothing to do with Israel. It has to do with an old, with the old hatreds. And what the present focus on anti-Semitism connected to criticism of Israel is doing is deflecting attention away from that. And that is a real danger. That is a real danger. I'll play another clip now. This is from a film we did, I did, uh, we did uh, 12 years ago called Peace, Propaganda, and the Promised Land uh, that talked about this uh, same thing. And in this, um, the, I particularly want you to focus on the, the, um, the comments of Robert Fisk. Uh, the great journalist uh, who deals with the Middle East. There are many American Jews who also believe it is their right to speak out against the occupation. Included among them are Jewish American rabbis. For their refusal to keep silent, they too have suffered threats and intimidation. One part of that intimidation has been to say that any Jew who raises criticisms about a current Israeli policy is a self-hating Jew. But on the contrary, my criticisms and Tikkun Magazine's criticisms of Israeli policy flow directly from our commitment to Judaism and our love for the Jewish tradition and our insistence that it be taken seriously, not just as a bunch of empty words, but as a set of principles that we really take seriously and believe in. The Israeli public relations machine knows that if the views and voices of Jews who disagree with its policies were to become public, it would be impossible to maintain the lie that any criticism of Israel is by definition anti-Semitic. In fact, the accusation of anti-Semitism has been Israel's most effective strategy in silencing dissent, and American journalists in particular have been targets of this tactic. Any environment in which a journalist or any person steps forward and starts making serious criticism of Israel, of America's relationship with Israel, the unconditional support for Israel, the failure of any serious pressure to be put upon Israel by the United States to prevent the building of further settlements for Jews and Jews only on Arab land. Any suggestion that the war between the Israelis and the Palestinians is a colonial war will be met by a deafening chorus of accusations, slanderous and lying though they are, that the person who brings up that subject is in some form an anti-Semite or a racist. And this remains the constant weapon that is used. The fact that anti-Semitism is alive and well in the world today makes it all the more important to differentiate between real anti-Semitism that needs to be condemned and opposed in its own right and its misuse as a PR strategy. Trying to scare people into silence by conflating any criticism of Israeli policies with anti-Semitism, in fact, detracts from the very real threat that anti-Semitism does pose because there are anti-Semites in the world, there are racists. And if this continued campaign of abuse against decent people, trying to shut them up by falsely accusing them of anti-Semitism continues, the word anti-Semitism will begin to become respectable. And that is a great danger. And then the really bad guys, and they're around, they do, there are people who want to build, burn synagogues, just like there are people who want to burn mosques. They'll start coming into their own. As he says, that's the real danger. You can actually make anti-Semitism respectable by labeling people who have nothing to do with it as, as though they're anti-Semites. That's the danger that Pisk, and I think that's the, the profound danger that we're in right now, is to make the fight against real anti-Semitism. Not the pretend kind in people's heads, but the stuff that happens out on the street and on people's bodies, to make that fight more difficult. Now, the impetus, so that's the general thing. We've, I've been working on this for a while with those two films. Um, the impetus for this particular event um, uh, uh, um, was, in fact, um, and I, 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 I was the person who first started thinking about organizing this. Uh, the reason for this, for this event was the extraordinary reaction to a talk. So I'm going to bring it local now. <laughs> We've gone general. I'm going to bring it local. was the extraordinary reaction to the talk 
earlier in the semester given by Thomas Suarez, uh, actually in this space. Um, this, this is, you might recognize, <laughs> this is Thomas Suarez giving a talk right here. And the talk was based on his book, State of Terror, How Terrorism Created Modern Israel, which is, a, which is based on recently declassified documents from the first part of the 20th century. I wish you could say it was a, it was a really turn, you know, page-turning read, but it's, it's, the, it's a work of history with all the hard work that goes into it. <laughs> there are historians here. <laughs> <laughs> I, I take that back. That was bad, badly put. Yeah, but in fact, this the book is. It's been very well received. Um, this is a quote from Ilan Pape, the eminent uh, new one of the new Israeli historians. He says, "A tour de force, based on diligent archival research that looks boldly at the impact of Zionism on Palestine and its people in the first part of the 20th century." This book is the first comprehensive and structured analysis of the violence and terror employed by the Zionist movement and later the State of Israel against the people of Palestine. And so this is a work of history going back, at the, going back into the, the first part of the 20th century. And it is, I think, a, an, a, an incredible piece of work, an incredible piece of research. So we had a very nice event. Uh, you, you saw the picture, we had, it was kind of full, it wasn't as full as this, but it was kind of full. <laughs> we had a very nice event, uh, he spoke for about 45 minutes and people had questions for him. Some were adversarial, but they were all very respectful. Um, and you know, we had that discussion and he finished and I thought, oh, I actually told someone, I said, I, I, just, I was just at the perfect university event. Like someone gave, gave, gave me a really strong statement based on their research and then you know, respectful discussion uh, of, of that. It's exactly what a university event should be. Well, that was the reality. The question then was, <laughs> so I was surprised when the next week when I started reading some of the reaction. Now, actually, the Collegian had one very good story on it where there was a reporter who came and said what was going on. But then there was this in the Collegian from a, from a columnist, a columnist who had not come to the event columnists who had not come to the event, saying it was anti-Semitic. That the anti-Semitism of the Thomas Juarez event is not the way to discuss the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. He went on to say, Suarez's rhetoric is detriment to the Jewish student body on campus. And I was kind of scratching my head. It's like, did Tom Suarez speak at another event on some other book that, that I didn't really you know, know about, that it had, that had this kind of reaction? Although it should have given me a clue when, when I found out that the person who wrote it didn't, wasn't at the event. Okay, that tells you it's nothing to do with the event. It's got nothing to do with, with the actual content of ideas. It's to do with shutting down <coughs> debate by name-calling, by labeling people anti-Semites. Then a few days later, again, um, this is, we're really in the weeds now. <laughs> On this, a few days later, I'm reading, I've got another, um, there's a, this is another online local source, uh, Annis Wire. And suddenly, again, this is now, says, uh, uh, and I actually didn't even realize that there was a campaign against Suarez, a letter writing campaign to the chancellor, I think before he came, to get him to cancel the event. So there was all this, I was so naive, I just stopped it, you know. <laughs> but there was all this organizing going on around it. Uh, and again, the same, you know, that, that, that Suarez is a hate figure, that Suarez is an anti-Semite, uh, that his research is, um, you know, that his research is deeply flawed. Uh, and then, it goes national. Then the Washington Free Beacon picks it up. And what does it refer to? It refers to the Collegian article and the Amos Wire article. That becomes the source, and so now it's in the national. It's, it's well, the Washington Beacon is a right-wing conservative outlet, but it's now, it's very it's, it's got wide uh, wide distribution, and now this little this event that happened here, which I thought I saw what, was was one thing, was redefined and is now being is being shown is now being described as something totally else, as something totally different. Uh, so I was it was like really um, as a, uh, the Washington Post picks it up, the Washington Free Press picks it up, references exactly the same comments in the article about Suarez, 
Um, in fact, in the article, it lumps him in with someone who supposedly uh, is claiming that 9-11 was not just an inside job, but was planned by Israel. So it's totally discrediting him. Actually, I, I haven't read that other book. I'm pretty sure that's not what the book said. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's not what the book would have said, um, but that's the way it gets framed. But, you know, why let the truth get in the way? Also referenced in the Washington Free Beacon was a statement by three university professors, by three UMass professors, sorry, not UMass, by three UMass professors. Again, I'm so naive, I thought I didn't even... <laughs> um, in, in the, the, about Suarez. This is what that statement said. It took me a while to get the statement from them, but it was put out because it was in, it was on the Washington Free Beacon, Washington Free Beacon. and this is what the statement said. It said, Thomas Suarez's book, and I'm going to read because it's quite remarkable. This is from three academics talking about a work of history. Okay. Thomas Suarez's book is a deeply flawed work by an amateur author full of factual errors and distortions of the archival record. There are numerous serious historians who take an honest look at Israel-Palestine in the 1940s. The book is mostly before the 1940s, by the way. So it makes me wonder if they even read the book. Now, there are lots of people in the 1940s and, and at the violence of the conflict, but Suarez does not belong to this category. While we uphold our collective rights to free speech and we uphold the rights of students and, and faculty to listen to whoever we choose, it is disappointing to you to see a student group, SJP, um, a private publisher, Interlink Publishers, who <coughs> books who published uh, the work, um, and an off-campus political group. I think that was the Media Education Foundation. I don't know how you became an off-campus political group. Oh, no, that, that would have been JDP, sorry. That was JDP. <laughs> um, to use um, a political group, use our university as a platform to promote an ideological polemic like Suarez's which aims only to demonize one side. This is unscholarly incitement and the sort of irresponsible historical inquiry uh, uh, unworthy of, uh, of a research university. That's strong stuff. From academics, talking, that is really, really strong stuff. And they then reference, then I was, you know, the reason I went to get the statement from them, I thought, oh, well, they must have written something about this. There must be a very elaborate you know, paper trail on this to make someone to make statements like this. And so I, I, when I got the statement, there was one reference, which was, you can see there, the references to Collier and, um, and, uh, and Hoffman. That's the only reference. It's a, actually, it's a, it's a, it's a PDF critique of the book. Uh, they're not actually, they're not professors, they're not academics. <laughs> if you want the word amateur used for anyone, they're actually a couple of Zionist trolls, famous in the US and famous in London, for coming to events and disrupting events. They actually were at an event with Thomas Suarez where they just got up and started shouting in the middle of it. They were hoping, and they had, to, they had to stop the event because there wasn't security around for them. But in this mode now, these <laughs> I said, these, um, these Zionist activists who do nothing but disrupt have become now respectable resources that academics can use. I found this actually quite amazing. Quite, you, can see, you can see it was published or printed by Jay Berkowitz, Dan Gordon, and Jonathan Skolnick. Um, I think what will be really useful next year, and I, su I suggest this too, I would love to see a debate. We'll invite Thomas Suarez back, and we'll have his three UMass professors debating. I would love to. These, isn't that what universities are supposed to be? They're supposed to be about debate. I'm not holding my breath for that to take place. Um, I mean, these same the, the Holly, uh, Collier and Hoffman. They were, I said, they're notorious in the U.S. in, in the U.K. They were responsible. For, cancel, for getting two talks cancelled by the distinguished professor Richard Falk, for getting them cancelled because, because it was going to be too much trouble to, have to put them on. And that who is now, that's the basis now for this kind of discussion. So I was in, what I was interested in was the circulation of information. I mean, there's a, there's, a, there's a conflict as well. But I'm interested in how it gets talked about and gets talked about at the national level, but also at this very nitty gritty local level, how it's talked about on campuses and how that campus discussion then gets picked up uh, by other places. 
Uh, so I'm interested in the circulation of information. I, and, I, and the reason I got interested, once I looked at this, I thought, holy, that, that, that's almost exactly what happened when we showed this film at a couple of universities. It happened at Case Reserve University in Cleveland, um, in which the, the, the group that was put, on, that put it on, the, the Radical Student Union, was actually labeled, was put on a list by someone of being an anti-Semitic group for showing the film. And it also happened at UCLA, where we had organized a screening actually almost exactly a year ago now, because UCLA was ground zero for the attack on Palestinian students, or pro-Palestinian students, uh, by, by, by people like David Horowitz's group, who were putting up posters on, on, on walls with, with students' names on it and faces on it, calling them terrorists and, and anti-Semites. It was, it was just the, the most vicious attack. And so we went there to, give, to do an event as, uh, as, a, as an act of solidarity with, uh, with these poor students um, who were being attacked in this way. Actually, and, Ro and you, you, you decided Roger Waters from Pink Floyd was the narrator of our film, and actually Roger came to the event to give it even more high profile. And again, the event was very nice. We had the event. We had the film. Um, there was some question and answer afterwards. It was, I wouldn't say it was all civil, but it was, you know, it was debate. It was debate. So then, again, the same thing happens. A few days later, this is the collision. This is the, 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 the UCLA paper. Does exactly the same thing. This is in the Daily Brewing. There's a columnist that calls it, uh, uh, endorses attempt to normalize anti-Semitism. So our, our little film, you know, which is a nice little, I think, I kind of think of it as very mild-mannered and quite academic in terms of how, <laughs> of how you know, low-key we are on it, suddenly is now normalizing anti-Semitism. After the fact. After the fact. If you go back to the Thomas Suarez event, it actually was very interesting that the people said they came, the people, some of the people who commented that said it was anti-Semitic, said they came to the event and they saw it, thought it was anti-Semitic. And it was interesting, they never said it at the time, because if they'd said it at the time, they would have been laughed out of the room. Because people actually would have had something to compare it to, which is what Thomas Suarez just said. And so it's been, this, this distancing this is very, very, uh, is very, very important. Well, the Daily Brewing does it, it gets picked up by something called the Jewish News Service. This is the key service, actually. This, this uh, the Jewish News Service, essentially trolls college newspapers. Because they know that almost anything can get it. I mean, sorry if anyone's here from the Collegian. Um, <laughs> but there's such a low level of, especially for columnists, you can say anything. There's such a low level of, uh, you know, of, of examination of it that they, tr they troll around and they get something. And once they get it, it becomes fact. They then put it out, and it's now fact. So, the daily, so there was a column in the Daily Bruin, and now this is on, it's now picked up by this new service, and this new service then puts it out, and goes into, this is David Horowitz's uh, um, uh, uh, online site. Uh, it made it into Breitbart. It's the first time we made it into Breitbart. It was, we were quite happy when we did that. <laughs> we made, made the mainstream. Uh, and it also makes it into the Jerusalem Post. Anti-Semitic film, in quotes. So this is the circulation of information that I am really interested in. How things, especially in an age of online, uh, of online distribution, how things become facts. How things become facts. Um, I'll go quickly. I'm not going to. Uh, there was another one. This is uh, again. There's so much of this after the UCLA stuff. Um, we also showed it in Marblehead a few weeks ago, uh, just north of Boston, and this was an ad that came out before, in a, a full-page ad in a local newspaper in Marblehead, calling it anti-Semitic. Um, there was demonstrations at the event. It's the first time actually I've been at an event where, as you're walking through, you get called, you get called a racist and a fascist and, a, and an anti-Semite. It's, you know, you can, I mean, I kind of try to laugh at it, but it's not particularly ple pleasant. When it actually happens. And of course, <laughs> the Jerusalem Post picks it up. Because it's in, it's in the local press as well. So this is, okay, this is ongoing. This is ongoing. The, the, this is a, a pattern that has been you know, been established for a while. And in fact, when we looked at it, at the, 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 this thing called the Jewish News Service seems to be the key, which seems to be the key uh, institution within this. Um, I mean, they know that they can go to these places 
where you know, people have drunk the Kool-Aid and they know that they, all they have to do is say anti-Semitic, they'll get on. And then they take that and they, they, um, uh, they make it spectacular. Um, I have no doubt that this event itself will be treated in exactly the same way. It will be treated in, <laughs> which is designed to look at how the charge of anti-Semitism is used to silence critic criticism of the Israeli policy. It will be called, I guarantee you, it will be called anti-Semitic for the mere fact of, 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 of having it. Uh, and those definitions will circulate and ultimately, I'm sure, will appear in the pages of, uh, of right, -wings, right wing and reactionary media outlets. And as that happens, I'll finish, as, as that happens, this is my main point I want to make. As that happens, there will be no discussion of what is happening to the Palestinian people. The Palestinians will have disappeared in this process. There will be no discussion of Palestinians, and that's the ultimate aim of this strategy of charging anti-Semitism to any criticism of, Israel, of what Israel is doing to the Palestinians. And my, my plea to you is do not let them become invisible. Do not let the Palestinians become invisible. And do not let the fascist expression of anti-Semitism, the real fascist expression of anti-Semitism, go unchallenged. Those two things are connected. The fight against fascism and the fight for Palestinian rights are connected together. And they've been made in this Then our second speaker will be Vijay Prashad, who's the executive director of Tricontinental, the Institute for Social Research, and chief editor of Leftward Books. This is his last event as an academic. Um, he taught for 21 years at Trinity College in Hartford, Connecticut. He's the author of 25 books and has edited 20 others, among which are The Darker Nations and The Poorer Nations, as well as Letters to Palestine, Writers Respond to War and Occupation. He writes regularly for Frontline and for The Hindu in India, also for Birgun in Turkey, and for Alternate in the US. He's on the board of the US Campaign for the Academic and Cultural Boycott of Israel, a branch of the international BDS movement, Boycott, Divestment, and Sanctions movement. Good evening. Thanks for being here. Uh, I'm the outsider. I'm the one who's decided to enter your campus. So thanks for welcoming me to UMass. Uh, I have uh, written a short text which I'll read out. And this text is entitled, Anti-Semitism is Real, So is the Israeli Occupation. It comes in four parts. Part one is called The Thesis. The thesis of my talk arrived yesterday in an email from Rabbi Elisa Weiss. Rabbi Weiss wrote, the spread of anti-Semitism in this country is real and terrifying. Neo-Nazis march down America's main streets. The president calls them very fine people and retweets conspiracy theorists claiming Jews control the world's finances. White supremacists have growing platforms in mainstream media and receive humanizing portraits in the New York Times. But who is most likely to be labeled anti-Semitic? Advocates for Palestinian human rights like you. Enough. Real anti-Semites like Steve Bannon have joined forces with right-wing Zionist groups like the Zionist Organization of America to forge a toxic political force, Zionist anti-Semitism. The only way to fight oppression is to fight all oppression. That is what real intersectionality means. That's why we fight for Palestinian human rights and why we don't see a contradiction between fighting anti-Semitism and fighting devastating Israeli policies. That's Rabbi Elisa Weiss. Who is the we in Rabbi Weiss's note? It is Jewish Voice for Peace, one of the co-sponsors of this event, of which she is the deputy director. Her point is cogent. 
the real anti-Semites, namely the fascists who go by the name alt-right, get a free pass, while those who are against anti-Semitism and who are critics of Israeli state policy are labeled as anti-Semites. Part 2. The process of liberation is irresistible. In late September 1982, on the front page of an Indian newspaper, I saw an image that would change the way I saw the world. It showed a line of dead Palestinians from the Sabra and Shatila camps in Beirut, Lebanon. It was a picture taken by the American photographer Robin Moyer of Time magazine. This picture from Beirut was harsh. It suggested that the Israelis and their phalange allies had confiscated the humanity of the Palestinians. Not long afterwards, I wrote my first political article. This was on the massacre at the camps of Sabra and Shatila. I was on the editorial collective of a little magazine at my school, The Circle. The report appeared in its inside pages. What bothered me was the nonchalance in the aftermath of the killing. There was outrage, and then there was nothing. U.S. Secretary of State Henry Kissinger mumbled his assent to Israeli policy, blocking any international criticism of the illegal invasion of Lebanon and the proxy massacre at Sabra and Shatila. Soon enough, more pressing issues came before me. Exams, love, and the Delhi riots of 1984. In Delhi, it was said that members of a Dalit or oppressed caste community had killed Sikhs on the orders of the ruling Congress party, just as the Falange in Beirut had killed Palestinians on the orders of the Israeli occupying forces. The numbers of the dead were about the same in both incidents, 3,000. And so too was the complicity of the ruling apparatus in the deaths, whether the Israeli occupying force or the Congress-led government. There was ruthlessness in both, hardness in the soul of those who authorized it. Pressure from a United Nations Commission, chaired by Sean McBride, moved the Israelis to empanel the Kahani Commission, which found tepidly that Defense Minister Ariel Sharon bore responsibility for the massacre, but did not charge anyone with crimes against humanity. Sharon resigned, but then returned as minister without responsibility, later as Prime Minister of Israel. In India, successive governments created a series of inquiry commissions, but to no avail. There was to be no justice in either case for the dead. What interested me was another similarity. How was it that a people who had experienced oppression, Jews in one instance, Dalits in another, could be part of such an atrocity? It is what moved me to research the lives of the Balmikis, a community accused, perhaps unfairly, of the killings, for my PhD and then my first book. It is what moved me to wonder about my complicity in the violence around me, the advantages that I gain from violence used by states against people who are disadvantaged. It is what has moved me ever since to cover as a journalist the asymmetrical violence of the Israeli occupation against the Palestinians. What bothered me beyond all else is that asymmetrical violence. This is what troubled me as an undergraduate student at Pomona College, where I joined other decent idealists in the anti-apartheid struggle and the struggle for justice in El Salvador. In each case, imperialism, a word long out of fashion, but one that I hope someday will return to common use. In each case, imperialism was in close cahoots with local thugs. The apartheid regime in South Africa, the junta of Jose Napoleon Duarte, and the Likud government of Yitzhak Shamir. 
It was never only Shamir or P.K. Bota who were the problem. It was the structure of imperialism that suffocated the freedom of peoples of Southern Africa, Central America, and Western Asia. It was this that moved me. It is this that continues to shape how I, as a reporter, have covered the Palestinian conflict. It is what moved me to write about the murder by Israeli soldiers of a 15-year-old boy, Abdullah Hussein Nasrara, near Nablus, and about the strike from an Israeli drone that killed another 16-year-old boy, Anas Mahmoud Hussein Muammar, in Rafah, as he drank coffee with his brothers, and about the Israeli bombing that killed 19 children from the Abu Jamai family in Khan Yunis, ages ranging from four months to 14 years old. It is what moves me to write about the Israeli occupying forces, which are funded and backed by the United States government. The Israeli occupation is a failure. The arrogance and anxiety of the Israeli forces at the checkpoints shows their tenuous hold on power. The exhausted swagger of the occupying police in Jerusalem marks the futility of their project. One policeman told me in 2015 that he is fed up. He finds his job hopeless. The most messianic zealots are the settlers. They are armed and violent. For them, the Arab is vermin. They have descended into inhumanity. Their hold on Israeli politics is firm. The 1960 UN Declaration on the Granting of Independence to Colonial, colonial Countries and Peoples puts it bluntly. The process of liberation is irresistible. It is what motivates the Palestinian cause. To take their position is to stay with international law. A combination of the intractable dreams and struggles of the Palestinians and the BDS movement strive to revive the idea of peace. There is no anti-Semitism in this irresistible process. Part 3, anti-Semite. For my reporting on the asymmetrical Israeli violence on the Palestinians, I have been called anti-Israel and an anti-Semite. There are two ways in which this attack has impacted my own career. And I generally don't talk about myself like this, so forgive me, but here, here it is. First, various Zionist organizations have consistently pressured my college administration to either remove me from positions of responsibility or indeed to silence me. In 2010, when I was the founding director of the Trinity Institute for Interdisciplinary Studies, some faculty members on my campus asked for me to be removed because of my leadership in the BDS movement. Leaders of various Jewish organizations in Connecticut contacted the president of my college. He would not meet them. A faculty member at my college then wrote to him to say, and this is a quote, I absolutely and unequivocally recommend to you that you personally take the meeting with the leaders of the state's Jewish community. Never in my worst nightmare could I imagine a scenario in which the leaders of the Jewish community would ask to meet with the president of Trinity College and not be granted a meeting. The president did meet with them on September 14, 2010. I was not informed of the meeting, nor told of it until the emails between the faculty members and the president were leaked to the forward newspaper. This is four years later that they will leave. Robert Fishman of the Connecticut Jewish Federation, Gary Jones of the Anti-Defamation League, and Laura Zimmerman of the Jewish Community Relations Council met the president to express their concerns. Fishman said that he put a veiled threat on the table. We wanted the president to know that we didn't go directly to Jewish donors to weigh in, but we left it open that this was a card to play if the verbal commitment wasn't honored. I was not told about this verbal commitment, but it was made clear to me that I was not to talk about BDS on campus or else. Or else. I went to India and then to Lebanon 
to wash away the ugliness of that period. These visits by Zionist groups would be repeated again during the American Studies Association vote for BDS and during Israel's 2014 pummeling of Gaza. In January 2014, I published an op-ed in the Washington Post called Understanding the Boycott of Israel's Universities. That summer, I wrote extremely critically of Israel's bombing of the 140 square mile, miles of Gaza, the destruction of lives, the devastation of hospitals and schools. The pressure returned to my college. It never stopped. Second, in these past 10 years, nine departments in nine US universities of higher education put forward my name to their upper administrations towards a senior level higher. In all nine of these institutions, meetings were hurriedly organized to make sure that these hires would not take place. <coughs> what lay on the table was always the criticism of Israel. It was portrayed as hate speech and risk-averse institutions were told not to welcome a controversy needlessly. The job offers vanished. UMass, of course, as some of you know, knows a thing or two about this kind of incident. On August 24, 2014, the forward ran a story with a catchy headline, anti-Israel professor returns to Trinity College, will controversy come back too? What is the controversy? My criticism of the Israeli occupation, which has been deemed by the United Nations to be illegal? There is not a whiff of anti-Semitism on the table, but that is the aroma that is spread around to make the whole matter stink. Who wants to deal with someone who has that smell on them? Part four, human beings. In July 2012, the UN sent a fact-finding mission to Israel to study illegal settlement activity. Israel did not allow the mission to enter the country. A few months later, Israel bombed Gaza for a week. This was Operation Pillar of Defense. The bombing run killed 174 Palestinians, according to the United Nations. Among them were 10 members of the Dalu family, including Sarah, age 7, Jamal, age 6, Yusuf, age 4, and Ibrahim, age 1. A few days after that bombing run, I was at the United Nations to cover the historical vote to provide Palestine with a new status, non-member observer status. Say, this new status, it would have, if it had ever tangible meaning, would deliver the new state a mere 18% of historic Palestine. The day after the vote, Israel decided to extend its lands in the moth eaten West Bank with a pledge to build 30,000 more homes for Israeli Jews. A few days after the vote, on December 1st, Eight Israeli soldiers and two settlers beat a 70-year-old Palestinian farmer, Ahmed Mahimedin, who was planting seeds on his land just east of Bethlehem. They wanted him to get out of the 18%. Jigar Murarabadi, an Indian poet, who wondered about this sort of injustice, leaves us with this thought. Kya kayamat hai ki is door e tarakki mein jigar Admi se admi ka haq ada hota hai. How tragic, Jigar, that in this progressive age, people do not follow the role assigned to humans. Thanks a lot. And then finally, our third speaker is Joseph Levine, professor and chair of philosophy at UMass Amherst. He's also a member of the Academic Council of Advisors to Jewish Voice for Peace and a member of the Western Mass chapter of, of Jewish Voice for Peace. He's been active in movements for Palestinian rights for over three decades and published many op-eds, including in the New York Times on the topic. I wanted to actually talk not, I mean, you, you've heard plenty about the frame of, of the silencing. Uh, of criticism of Israel that um, comes with the charge of anti-Semitism. And you've also heard about the real worry that in this day and age, especially the age of Trump and Steve Bannon and those people, about 
the real fear that is uh, um, pervading the Jewish community uh, when you see you know people marching in Charlottesville saying Jews will not replace us. I think that was the. Uh, um, and it's interesting because in a certain way I, I've actually come to look at the question of anti-Semitism somewhat differently than I did <laughs> before the, all this happened. Um, it's not surprising that some people have thought there is no anti-Semitism in the United States. Um, if you look at the position, socioeconomic position, political position and the like of, and let me qualify, European Jews in this country, um, uh, we do very well. I grew up feeling no sense of restriction. So the, this, the idea that Jews were, had their prospects, their life prospects, narrowed and restricted in the way that people of color and queer people and, and women in general have, that was not a part of my experience growing up. So where does the anti-Semitism become systemic and oppressive? Well, um, uh, I was just rereading for a class of mine, Iris Young's very important work called The Five Faces of Oppression. And she mentions these five forms or mechanisms by which uh, oppression is realized um, in a group. And the first four of them are exploitation, powerlessness, marginalization, and cultural imperialism. The first three, I think, for the latter half of the 20th century and into the 21st century, do not apply to the European Jewish community. Cultural imperialism, maybe, but you know, mildly. But then the last one is violence. And it's really important to understand that it's not just actual violence, it's the fear of violence. The way that that structures how you look at your place in the world. And I think that I understand very well. So in other words, it's a very common experience for Jews to feel we're doing okay now, you know? We've got, you know, we're professors all over the place. There aren't the quotas that there used to be. You know, the, a lot of those, all of those formal um, barriers have basically come down, but it's precarious. One of these movements that we think of as marginal could take over and this could all vanish. And I do think that fear is legitimate and justified, and I do think it has an effect. Um, and it's legitimately a form of oppression. So I just wanted to, that's sort of the frame in which I see this now. Um, I also want to mention one other aspect of personal experience, and then I wanted to do something else. I wanted to actually look at the claim that anti-Zionism and anti-Israel criticisms are anti-Semitic, I want to actually read the claims and say, what's wrong with them, right? Not, you know, not just the, the crazy stuff, that would not, but the actual claims. So, well, maybe it's crazy, but anyway. Um, but I did want to say something about personal experience because we've been talking a lot about, and I just myself talked about the anti-Semitism of the right and how scary that is. But of course, what a lot of our critics uh, are saying is, yeah, but what about the anti-Semitism of the left? Isn't there any of that too? Uh, especially in the, in the Palestine Solidarity Movement. So, again, I can't speak for the whole movement. <laughs> I haven't been everywhere all the time. But I do want to just talk about my own personal experience with that for having been involved in this work, of Pal Palestine Solidarity work, since basically around 1980. Um, I've met thousands of Palestinians, Arabs, others who were involved in this work. And have I ever encountered anti-Semitism? Well, yes, I have, actually. And maybe in question and answers, I can tell you about one or two incidents. But that's not actually what's striking. What's puzzling to me is why have I encountered so little of it? I mean, think about it. When you go to, especially you go to the West Bank and Palestine, and you see how hundreds of thousands, millions of people are under the boot of a military that is brutal and that tells them day after day, we have to put you down because we as Jews, and they, as, they always say that, this is our land, you have no place here. How could some people not say, maybe I don't like Jews very much? 
What surprised me is how few such people I actually have encountered. How um, relatively clean of any whiff of anti-Semitism I personally have found for all the conferences. I spent two weeks in the early 90s going up and down the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. Everyone knew I was Jewish. Um, I never really felt that. And I do have a hypothesis about why. One is, of course, to the credit of the Palestinian movement. I think um, they, at least, maybe not as much at the beginning, but later on, were very clear about making the distinction between Jew and Zionist and Israel. One is a political movement. The other is a religious, ethnic, however you want to define it, group. And they were clear about that. But here's another aspect of it. And I think it's because there have always been principled, conscientious Jews who have loudly denounced the oppression of Palestinians. And I'm talking from the beginning, from Judah Magnus, the first president of a Hebrew university, to Noam Chomsky, to the tens of thousands of members of my organization, Jewish Voice for Peace, all the Jewish students that are in Students for Justice in Palestine, and on and on. And it was clear that the Palestinians I met had been used to meeting solidarity activists who were Jewish. They were just, they were all over the place uh, when I went. Um, and I think that made it clear that this was not a Jewish issue, this was an Israel Zionist issue. Okay, so now let me just say a little bit about the actual charges of anti-Semitism that are usually leveled at the uh, Palestine Solidarity Movement. I'm going to read from an op-ed from somebody from UCLA, um, somebody I'm sure you guys know, Judea Pearl, uh, who's a professor of computer science there. And this had to do with the fact that the Board of Regents of the University of California were at the time trying to come up with a definition of anti-Semitism to say what, what could or could not be used on campus. And it was not a very good one. I, I'll, I'll get into that in a second. But here's what Pearl said in his thing. And he says, if we examine anti-Zionist ideology closely, we see that its aims are to uproot one people, the Jewish people, from its homeland, from its homeland, keep that in mind, to take away its ability to defend itself in sovereignty and to delegitimize its historical identity. It is racist and funda fundamentally eliminationist. Um, and then one other quote from him, some critics object to comparing Zionophobia uh, with Islamophobia, as I have, arguing that Zionism is a political belief while Islam is a religion. In the modern court of ethics, however, religion does not have a monopoly on human sensitivity. That is to say, religions are not entitled to a greater protection from discrimination than other identity-forming narratives, including those based on race, gender, national origin, or historical lore. Okay, keep those in mind. Now I want to read to you from the U.S. Department of State definition of anti-Semitism. This is, by the way, official. Okay. Um, what is anti-Semitism relative to Israel? This is from the Department of State website. Demonize Israel. All right. If you draw comparisons of contemporary Israeli policy to that of the Nazis, if you blame, uh, if you use the symbols and images associated with classic anti-Semitism to characterize Israel or Israelis, but here's another one. Delegitimize Israel. This is the crucial one. Denying the Jewish people their right to self-determination and denying Israel the right to exist. Okay? You do that, that is automatically, by definition of the State Department, anti-Semitism. Um, and so I want to talk about that. Um, I think in the end, one finds that there are two basic kinds of charges. How many minutes? I can't read that. OK. That one finds. Um, one is you, you get anecdotes. You know, that pro-Palestinian activist said death to the Jews. Well, you know, how is it going to verify all of these? So I, I want to leave those aside. And I, my personal experience has been when these things have been um, investigated, they usually don't come out true. But what about this one about self-determination? Okay, first thing I want to say is it's based on three premises. 
One is that Jews constitute a nationality, not a religious group. This is something, by the way, Suarez talked about. He talked about the racializing of Judaism that Zionism does. Second premise, that Palestine is the historical homeland of the people that now call themselves Jews. People like me, right, whose roots go back to Eastern Europe for generations and generations. Um, and then three, that states ought to be organized on anything other than civic conceptions of nationality. Okay? I think all three premises are false. Um, I don't think that's the right way to think about Jews as a group. Um, I think the claim, and we can discuss this in question and answer, that this is a homeland from 2,000 years, that somehow my ancestor, I can trace my ancestry back, and that gives me a claim to a land that other people have been living in for uh, th hundreds and hundreds of years is a, is a nonsensical claim. There is no other case in history that I know of where anything like that has ever been considered legitimate. But the main thing is, I think that ethnic states are an abomination on democratic principles. On democratic principles, every state ought to be organized by all the people who are legitimately citizens, are all considered free and equal, and they all have collective sovereignty. This idea of Jewish sovereignty in a land that is not all Jews, and certainly when they first came there, it was 90%. Palestinian Arabs, that uh, uh, is, is, a, is, to me, just a complete um, in contradiction with uh, basic democratic principles. But there's also a historical factor here. I just want to end with this. So the Jewish emancipation in Europe, which began in, under the Enlightenment and was carried forward, especially by Napoleon's breaking of the, down of the ghetto walls, right? And it's called the Jewish, it's called the emancipation, right? That allowed Jews to finally enter normal society in Europe. It was incredibly important to those people. It was considered anti-Semitic to claim that Jews were a different nation. That Jews weren't just as much a French person as, a, as, as the non-Jewish French person. Wasn't just as English, wasn't just as German. <laughs> To claim Jews were an other, an alien nation body that needed their own land was by most Jews at that time thought of as an anti-Semitic um, uh, position. And I just want to read to you a couple of quotes from back in 1917 when there was actually really vibrant debate within the Jewish community over the Zionist enterprise. And, um, I want to read to you a statement that actually came from two leaders of, of uh, uh, British Jewry. Um, one was the head of the Board of De Jewish Deputies, uh, Board of Deputies of British Jews, and the other was the head of the Anglo-Jewish Association. And they were writing against the Balfour Declaration. They were opposing the Balfour Declaration, which we heard about a couple of weeks ago um, here. And here's what they said. They pointed out, and by the way, this comes from this absolutely wonderful book, Palestine, the Reality, which is being published by Michelle's uh, Interlink uh, publishing company, and I highly recommend it. OK, enough of a plug. So here's what they said. They pointed out the theories of political Zionism undermine the religious basis of Jewry. The only alternative to a religious basis would be, and this is a quote, a secular Jewish nationality recruited on some loose and obscure principle of race and of ethnographic peculiarity. But this would not be Jewish in any spiritual sense, and its establishment in Palestine would be a denial of all the ideals and hopes by which the survival of Jewish life in that country commends itself to the Jewish conscience and to Jewish sympathy. On these grounds, the conjoint committee of the Board of Deputies and the Anglo-Jewish Association deprecates most earnestly the national proposals of the political Zionists. Okay, I mean, now, were these guys anti-Semitic? Right? Now, it is really interesting when you go and read some other things, I don't have time, but maybe I'll read some more later in question and answer. It's really clear, one of the big fears they had was that Zionism was gonna undercut their position in the countries, well, they were Europeans, in the European countries. Right? Um, 
It was, they were fighting for equal citizenship. And I say today, too, you know, um, we have this renewed fear of anti-Semitism, and I think it's justified. But I want to ask us, who are our allies here? Who are going to be the people that are going to put their bodies and souls on the line to protect any of us? Jews, blacks, Latinos, queers, and Palestinians. And I want to ask, is it the Steve Bannons and Richard Spencers, or is it the Linda Sarsours? I think I know the answer. Thank you. Thank you.